Hi there, Glocal citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu, and this week we're picking up the conversation with Hawa Kambian. Hawa is an intentional, passionate, and creative leader who enables organizational founders and their teams to achieve operational sustainability and social vibrancy by building results-driven cultures of connection. With a background in communications and humanitarian pursuits with organizations leading in innovative technology and social change, her experience spans education, digital health, and leadership development across government, nonprofit, and social enterprise sectors. She is an empathetic systems builder, which means she seamlessly flows between cultivating authentic relationships with people to draw out their strengths and creating strategic processes that allow teams to collaborate and achieve success together. In case you missed last week's episode, definitely go back. Howa tells us about her why the where and some of the inspiration that has delivered her to where she is now. And we're picking up the conversation with Howa telling us about Howa Cumbian Consulting, her latest endeavor. So leadership, as you did that work, and I think you've hit it on the nose, is one of the major challenges across the board, not only in business, but I mean, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how you're seeing that leadership carry over into the civil society sector, because I do feel like because we have such a, de- such a deficit in civil society of this kind of leadership attention, leadership training, leadership focus, that we are continuing to fail in the social services for people. So the not-for-profit sector flourishes to some extent, the private sector flourishes to some extent, but where we have the connectors in government, so to speak, in civil society, that's where I've observed that there's a true deficit. And so what are your thoughts on how to bridge that and offer and infiltrate that sector so that we have more robust societies as a whole? Yeah, I love this question, Florence. And I sigh here because (laughs) there's just... There's, it's, it's such a big topic and there's so much. And even through my company, How a Combi and Consulting, it is my goal and my vision to be able to plant a seed that grows or throw a stone in the water that has a ripple effect. I mean, whatever analogy <laughs> sits best with people. But when it comes to leadership, from my humble perspective, where I see the gap globally, but also specifically in Africa, is that I don't think we've been looking at this from multiple dimensions. And I think when we're talking about sustainability, growth, development, long-term, taking one angle towards a problem is a challenging way to really achieve a vision. And so the way I like to think about leadership is at the micro level, the meso level, and the macro level. And I'll break that down, right? So the micro level, individual people, individual humans, Hala, Florence, what is the leadership journey that we are going on as individuals, right? And when I, in my past work experience, right, I was working very closely with senior managers to support their own leadership, their performance, their ability to lead their teams. And when you start to get into that work, you realize how personal it is for people. You realize how personal the professional space is. You talk to a leader who you see is maybe behaving in a way that doesn't (laughs) align with your definition of what might be productive. And you start to talk to this person and you realize that there are fears, there are aversions, There are value systems of this individual leader that have a ripple effect into how they address the work, how they treat their team, what they prioritize. And at the end of the day, all of that trickles down into what an organization is able to generate and produce, right? So if we're not looking at and taking care of and supporting the personal development and growth of the humans... It's, it's going to come back away. We've missed the boat, yeah. Yeah, we've missed the boat. We're going to have to deal with it at one point or another. So if we neglect it early on, we will come to reckon with it down the road at some stage, right? So especially when you talk about civil society, I think really being able to invest in the mental health, the emotional intelligence, the communication skills, 
of professionals and leaders will go a long way towards supporting people's decision making, supporting people's sense of self, their boundaries, what they say yes and no to, how they prioritize. Because when you're able to do that at the individual level, right? Like when I how will wake up and I'm able to say, yes, I'm going to go to that event. No, I'm going to say no to that invite. Even that skill set that seems so simple and basic, when I can do that in my personal life, it gives me greater capacity and confidence to bring that into my professional world. And if I happen to be a director or a CEO, and I have the skill set and capacity to say yes to what I need to say yes to, that's in alignment with me and no to the things that are not in alignment, that has a ripple effect. And that can be the make or break factor on the sustainability of my organization, the relationships that I nurture or that I don't nurture, all of these kinds of things. And I think that is so core. And yet it is very easy to breeze past that and not even want to give that focus, attention or the weight that it deserves when we're looking at, oh, well, why does this problem exist? Or why are we struggling in this area? We tend to just neglect the human factor in these professional spaces. And I think that is a missed opportunity that doesn't just go away. It rears its head in other ways. It rears its head in conflict. It rears its head in unhealthy power dynamics. It rears its head in anxiety and mental health. And our societies, our families, our relationships pay the price for that. Right. We see it every day. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that is one key area at the macro that we need to be paying attention to. And then secondly, like when I look at this mezzo level, which is the organizational level, I've had just like, honestly, such a distinct pleasure to talk to so many entrepreneurs across the continent. And one of the things I've noticed, myself included, is that for the average African entrepreneur, most of us did not wake up at the age of eight or nine and be like, I'm going to go to business school. I'm going to become an entrepreneur, right? Like most of us did not have, that was just not our journey or it was not necessarily the thinking. Most of us are doing what we do because we've identified an opportunity to provide something of value to other people, or we've encountered a problem in our communities, in our societies where we're like, Hey, you know what? This isn't working. This could be better. And I think that I can step in and address this and resolve this. And that is a beautiful problem solver, solution oriented space to come from with entrepreneurship. It's a very like product program driven narrative, which is great, right? We need those structures to be able to offer something to people. At the same time, an organization is a lot more than what you offer people. It is systems. It is operations. It is culture. It is learning. And so really supporting founders and leaders to say, great, I'm here because I have a technical gift to offer or because like I'm just a visionary and I have great ideas for days and I can bring that together. But what is actually going to create the efficiency, effectiveness, and stability of what I am trying to create, that is where organizational management comes in. And again, not something that we talk about a lot. Like if, if we were to go on LinkedIn and read any random post, it would probably be talking about product and iteration, which is great. That is all important. At the same time, people tend to build your product. People tend to use your product, right? Are you understanding and paying attention to the dynamics that are happening therein? Are you ensuring that you're learning effectively? Are you communicating in a way that allows your team to understand what the goals are with building your product, communicating in a way that allows your customers and your stakeholders to really buy in and engage with your product. So that is a space that I've also observed when it comes to this space of leadership that founders, professionals, anyone who calls themselves a leader, there's, there's a beautiful little growth curve there that I think is a lifelong journey for all of us in terms of learning how to make sure that our reason for collectively bringing people together to create something for humanity, which yes, happy for that to make us money, happy for that to be profitable and for it to really achieve what it set out to and for it to really have this ripple effect. There are some core leadership components that 
in these narratives about profitability and being a unicorn and your runway and scaling, these conversations don't really happen. And they are, again, the sort of unseen behind the curtain elements that really help founders be in their integrity, create a product or service that is really going to stand the test of time and ensure that they are meeting a need. And I think that is something that also translates into the civil society in that sector, right? Like that public sector as well, really ensuring that you understand what is of value to the people that you serve and how to deliver upon that in a way that is effective and efficient and makes best use of our resources, but also of our knowledge, right? So that we can tap into that. And then the last thing I'll say is it all then culminates in that macro level, which is the social impact level, right? And in Africa, I know that in some circles, this is still a a conversation that is emerging around impact because in some circles, impact can be, it's a little bit of a dirty word because it makes people feel like you're not focused on profitability and being effective and efficient, right? But I really like to think of impact as another dimension of risk management. In the world we live in today, with the impact on the environment that we know we're all feeling at the moment, you can't negate and separate that from what your organization is doing. And your sustainability as an organization, you might even be undermining that by not focusing on environmental sustainability, for example, right? So like if you have a factory and you need the resources and the environment to support what your factory does, and you are producing at such a rate and in such a way that you are degrading the environment, then your factory is not going to be useful two, three years from now, right? And so we need to be able to think about the fact that these impact topics and areas are actually risk mitigation elements that we can leverage if we're thinking about them strategically. Same as you know, on the social side, engaging with the communities where you do your work as a business. If you are (laughs) like, let's say you own land in a community and your approach is that, okay, great. I am going to decimate this land and start encroaching on homes and settlements of the people in the local community. Do you think that local community are going to want to come and work for you and support the production of your product? Probably not. Right. And so it's, it's these tensions that where it's really important to be able to think through impact at the community level, stakeholders, suppliers, employees, environment, and ask ourselves, where are there opportunities for me as a business to ensure to have a win-win-win situation where as a business owner, I can drive towards what I'm trying to create. The stakeholders and the group supporting me are positively impacted by what I'm doing. And at the end of the day, we can deliver for the consumer. That to me is the win, win, win on the impact side. And so what I'm trying to do through how a Combian consulting and what we will eventually do, I'm confident, is really be able to bridge this micro, meso, macro connector so that at any point in time, it's really just a triangle with, with these three elements where any leader, any organization can connect to great. What is our human and personal development imperative? What are the needs and goals of our organization that need the structure to function? And how do we make sure that at every step along the way, impact and risk are being managed? So that's really the vision that I'm out here. Right, building, right. Wow, I love it. I, I really love how you just kind of picking up on what we were talking about with Western culture and Western identity and Western thinking and how that relates to what civil society is actually programmed to do because that is what our, 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 our structures, our democracy, our, yeah, I guess I want to call it the democracy, is structured to be that way. So I think that totally misses our indigenous ways of thinking. And it has kind of relegated us to be a little bit estranged from ways that we probably inherently understand leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's so much easier, Florence. And I mean, we've all been there. It's a lot easier to be told what to think than how to think, right? And the educational system across the world, I mean, from K to grade 12, right? Or to senior high school, 
where we're telling young people, hey, this is the information, take it, memorize it. And later I'm going to ask you to recite it and I'm going to judge you based on that. Versus really when you start adulting and you come into the real world, you realize how contradictory many of the things we've been taught are. And again, what's really beautiful in Africa is that entrepreneurship is really becoming a tool almost for people to say, cool, (laughs) the system isn't working and I want to find new ways to address this and approach this. I think the challenge we have for entrepreneurship and as entrepreneurs and founders in Africa is to say, great, how can I really tap into this in a way that kind of distills or holds everything that I think I know, everything that I think I understand, and really make sure that I'm coming to the root of this problem in a way that is authentic and taps into other ways of being and learning and doing outside of what you know I might read on fastcompany.com or <laughs> you know what I mean? or TechCrunch, right? Yeah, yeah, or TechCrunch, right? Which again, all great institutions, there's plenty to learn. The question is, how much of that do you base your foundation on versus saying, you know what, I'm going to create a, a mosaic of understanding from my own experience, from things I've learned talking to other people. Sure, from some of these secondary resources that exist out there, how do I really bring together all of that knowledge and make my own conclusions? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, I, I believe in a how a company in consulting. I know that it's going to be successful in doing that because we, I mean, we absolutely need, I always say this, we're in a leadership crisis. And that's why I was excited to speak to you about leadership and, and, you know, really trying to understand how do we get young people to recognize and be accountable to the idea of being leaders? Because I think a lot of times, increasingly, particularly because we have this social media culture that's very, you know, just showy. It's showing off, but it doesn't ask you to be a better person necessarily. You know, it's asking you to be a follower and showing these, you know, material things that don't really express who you are. And that's what a lot of young African youth are really kind of getting sucked into. Those that have the tools are really kind of sucked into this visual, maybe we'll call it visual leadership. So it's this fluff without anything else behind it. And then they they don't also know how to keep anyone accountable because all they are focused on is the optics. Wow. Florence, chef's kiss to that. (laughs) <laughs> like that was, no, that was so beautifully yeah. said. And I was just having a chat with another founder, a, a Northern founder yesterday. And we were talking about branding in Africa and in Ghana. And we were, we were going down the rabbit hole with it. And I was, I was saying to this gentleman that so much of what I'm trying to do on the personal branding front is bring back integrity and authenticity to branding. And you said it so beautifully that, yes, social media gives us a lot of the visual element. Oh, like, what are the colors of your brand? Is your hair done? Are your nails done? Like all of that kind of stuff, which is fine. That's great. However, at the end of the day, can you back that up? Where, where is the integrity, right? It's like, are you a business? And I was saying to this founder, if if you're going to say that you have a business that guarantees that it is going to give you a bowl of fufu and light soup in 20 minutes, and you slap that on social media, what is the operational cadence behind the scenes that ensures that you are getting that that foo-foo pounded fresh, that that light soup is coming in hot with all the ginger and garlic and onion and all of that good stuff that will actually ensure that you can deliver on it versus just saying, well, yeah, I can go nuts on social media and talk up and down about it. But then the day someone orders that, that's not what they get. And I think we get a lot of that happening where there's a lot of wishy-washy, inconsistency, fragmented energy in our leadership space. And the goal here is to really bring people back to that center and back to that alignment where that integration with who they really are, the confidence to really be who you are, and the discipline to follow through with that and to let that speak for itself, right? Still give us the visual, still give us the flash, but let us really believe and don't just show us, don't just tell us, really show us, really give us the experience that there is quality and intention and truth to who you say you are and to what it is that you're doing and what it is you have to offer to the world. Because all of us have that, 
And I don't care whether you have five followers or 5 million followers, everybody has the capacity and the ability to create that. And I think when we can get more into that space and more into that mindset and feel more confident and comfortable doing that and not having these vanity metrics define our worth, our value, our utility, and not judging other people off of these vanity metrics for their worth, their value, their utility, I think we will be a lot happier a lot less stressed, a lot less in this energy of comparison and scarcity and lack. And I think that's what drives a lot of, of the like toxic leadership that we'll say or the unhealthy leadership that we see. Yes, 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 yes. And I'm glad you, you kind of brought us to this point in the conversation to talk about mindset. And so I'm curious about your mindset hack. So what is your favorite or an innovative mindset hack, one that you practice, one that you know of, or one that you can imagine? You know, so I think the biggest one here, and it's simple, <laughs> isn't aren't all things in life like pretty simple and straightforward, Florence, but it's like the actual implementation and discipline is where, you know, sometimes we have to conquer our demons or our limiting beliefs. But I think for me in the last couple of years, it's really been around boundaries and saying no. And <laughs> I once said to a really, a, a really good dear friend of mine, when she was like, kind of in her like people pleasing energy and like talking to me about how she struggles to say no to things she really doesn't want to do. And I was like, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. Really just cultivating that ability to listen to yourself, listen to your, your, your true inner voice, listen to your instinct, listen to your gut when it's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. I'm not interested in this. And appreciate and accept the no that you're hearing. Right. And I can appreciate that not in every situation in life, we all just can't say, no, I'm out. But I think there's a beauty to hearing your no, accepting it, and then getting creative and being able to say, listen, life is not, we don't live life at extremes. I don't either have to say yes and be all in or say no and be shunned or isolated. And that's the thing. Most of us fear that saying no means we will be rejected. We will be left behind from a group. And I really, challenge all of us. And I'm constantly challenging myself to say, there's a lot of power in my no. And knowing that my no is coming from a place of, I need to be able to say yes to myself to do certain things. And sometimes that means I have to say no to the outside world, to other people, places, and things, right? And that there's there's beauty and strength in that. And in a scenario where you maybe can't just say an outright no, that gray area is a beautiful place to be where you can get creative right? You can hedge your bets, if you will. Great. If someone needed me to come over and babysit for five hours, yeah, maybe I can't do that, but maybe I can stop by for an hour or two, right? Like what is the happy medium that still makes sure that my needs are getting met and that I'm taking care of myself and that I can support other people as needed, right? And I think what I've noticed is that in Ghana, in Africa, that is a really challenging thing to do because, We tend to come from this very communal culture. Community is very big where we live. And so for a lot of people, their love language, and I've even noticed this with my parents, right? That like the love language is acts of service. I will do stuff for you. When you ask me for things, I will always say yes. And I will feel guilty if I must say no. And it's about learning to understand that we need to come into a healthy level of interdependence which positions us somewhere in the middle, right? Because codependence on one end of the extreme spectrum is where I need you for everything. And if you can't help me, then I'm suffering and it's your fault that I'm suffering and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other end of the of the spectrum is independence, where it's, I only want to do things by myself. Don't ask me to help you do things by yourself, do it alone, figure it out. And we need to find a way to meet somewhere in the middle there where we can be interdependent support each other as needed, rely on each other and not feel like we have to be pulled in either direction and that we're all open and accepting of when people need to assert their independence a little bit more, but also when people are like, hey, I really need your help and support. What could that look like? So I think for me, that is a big mindset hack that is a like it's a constant journey and life presents many opportunities to practice. So yeah, we're just flexing that muscle. I love how you said the no opera opens up the opportunity to be creative 
because, and particularly in the context of, of African cultures, because, you know, we've, we've been hearing lately and understanding that our foreign direct investments are as much as most of these economies, many African economies, right? We could be really lifting up the people. And a lot of the reason why there's so much investment or remittances is because of that guilt. I have to, I have to, I have to. Without the without the accountability for making sure that the things that these people are doing or wanting or needing is truly developing them. And so going back to that micro leadership that you mentioned, like these, this is where that comes in is because we really need to be thoughtful about our nose and being constructive about how we then are creative about, okay, well, but how else can we do this? How can you also help yourself? How can you also be accountable to to this relationship in in that kind of way. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I love what you just shared about the accountability side of it all, right? Because it really puts each of us in a position where we get to stand in our power. And that can be scary for some people. That can be terrifying. It, It is. Absolutely. It is. And many people have also been shamed for standing in their power or trying to exert their power and just express what they want and what they desire. And I think we need to reclaim no as a way of actually me saying no to you and communicating a boundary is actually a very healthy thing for someone to do. Because if someone actually didn't care enough about you to want you to understand what is important to them, but people pleasing actually can become a bit of a scapegoat to, yeah, I don't want to have to get into a real conversation about what matters to me or what my capacity is, right? So actually having these quote unquote, I won't call them hard conversations, they're courageous conversations. You know, stepping into something that is a little bit uncomfortable sometimes is actually, contrary to how it might feel, is actually like a huge step in in really just communicating your authenticity and being in your integrity, right? So all stepping stones. Yeah. So uh, I understand the Hawa that is this entrepreneur and leadership guru and and building and growing in her global existence. And so we want to know who Hawa is when she's not working. So how do you spend your time? How do how do you how do you do what you do? And and I like to frame this a lot of times as: Are you a reader? Are you a watcher? Are you a listener? And what are some of your favorite reads, watches, or listens? Okay, this is such an interesting question. So I'm a watcher. So I love watching cartoons. Oh, okay. Which I feel always kind of surprises people about me. So is it cartoons or is it just animated content? Like cartoons like the Sunday funnies or or not Sunday, the Saturday morning cartoons, or is it just animated? All of it. All of it. So that that space. Yeah, like we grew up, my brother and I grew up watching a lot of cartoons with our dad. And I just, I feel like it's just something that connects me back to my inner child and, you know, simpler times as they say, but also when, because the truth is all of this leadership elements that we've discussed, this stuff is heavy. Like it isn't just like an easy breezy conversation to have, right? Like there are insecurities and fears and, you know, pushing beyond comfort zones, all of that kind of stuff comes up when we're talking about this space. And it's sometimes really nice to just have something that is really light, that is just the complete opposite of all of that. So I know a lot of my friends are always just like, really? Cartoons are the thing? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Cartoons are the thing. Because it's a world where when I'm watching a cartoon, I never question that reality. You know, I never question that if Bugs Bunny is smelling a pie, that his whole body just starts to flow and he starts drifting towards the pie. I'm like, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Those are the rules of the animated reality. Sure. And yeah. again, I think it's, it's kind of a way to just like connect to creativity. Right. And remember that as much as the rules in our current reality feel so defined and rigid, they're not. And again, it comes back to this element of power, right? Like what are the self-limiting beliefs that I might have about myself or a situation or a relationship? And what is something that I can do that would actually flip that on its head or change the dynamic even just a little bit? And I feel like watching cartoons and getting into that realm of fantasy and maybe low-key escapism a little bit, but (laughs) it just brings me back to like, yeah, I have the opportunity and ability to do that. Uh, So that's definitely one. 
And then I don't know if this was on your list, but something that I love to do is I play guitar. So that is something that is very dear to my heart. Like it is a great way to almost just kind of process and unload, offload emotions. I even find and like singing is very cathartic. It's yeah, like it's a it's a conduit. Therapy, yeah. Yeah, and a way to just express yourself. So even in Montreal, like I got here and within the first couple of days, my friends were like, here's a guitar. <laughs> because they're like, we know you didn't bring your one from Ghana. And I was like, y'all know me well. So yeah, absolutely. Like music and TV, cartoons, all of that good stuff, I think. Are- so I just got to dig a little deeper on the cartoon. So what are some of your favorites? that you regularly watch or any new ones that you've picked up in the last few years? Yeah. So I feel like in the last few years, like adult animation has come into its own a lot more. So I would say like my, my OG throwbacks are things like SpongeBob. Cause it's like just so ridiculous, like so ridiculous and hilarious. And then some of like the adult comedy that I appreciate are things like Bojack Horseman on Netflix. Like I really enjoyed watching that series and just cause again, like it's, that's actually one where like, it's all anthropomorphic, right? So it's these animals who are acting as humans. And so it's got this fantasy element, but they are dealing with very real human emotions and experiences, right? So it's kind of the blending of those worlds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, those are some good ones. All right, so this has been so awesome. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm so happy that we had this conversation. I'm coming to visit you in Tamale, trust. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so before we sign off for the day, do you have any last words that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah. Thank you, Florence. I'm grateful for everyone who listens to this podcast and who's taken the time to listen to our conversation and connect with it. And if you see yourself as a leader, you're aspiring to be a leader. I just want to say we got you at Hawakambi and Consulting. We're really excited to connect with leaders in Africa, leaders of African descent, Because, yeah, I mean, this is, we're revolutionizing the future of work. Our time is now, yes. And I love that you say that, revolutionizing the future of work, because we do need it. Like, this is the understanding. And it's interesting, I don't know if you've caught this one, but President Obama has a work, a a special on Netflix that's about work. And so I I love that concept. I once pitched a a show that had that as a concept, but I really think that we need to really reimagine work and how it's happening and how we're, we're accomplishing it. So thank you for that. Where can we find you, Hawa? Well, um, I am on the socials, so I, I'll share all of that so it can jump into the show notes, but Perfect. effectively, howacombianconsulting.com, you will find all the goodies, all the linkages. That is a great landing spot to find out about what we're working on and how we can work together, as well as to connect into more information about me and other projects that I'm involved in. Wonderful. All right, Global Citizens, this has been another episode of the podcast. You can catch us Tuesdays with new episodes at GlobalCitizensPod.com or wherever you get your podcast. Please like, share, subscribe, leave us a review. It helps others find great content on the internet, particularly Apple or Spotify or Google. Anywhere, folks, just, just, just get involved. How about that? All right, so until next time, bye for now. <laughs>